Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no heart, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Peeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lulu. You're Lulu. Lulu, hoo-hoo. And we are joining you in 2023 now. Now we're recording in 2023. We're here. Officially. Officially. Woohoo! And we have a big announcement again that Lindsay is going to take over for summer camp. Yes. Okay, guys. It's happening. Wet, hot. Bad Magic Summer Camp is a go, as Mm -hmm. previously discussed. Tickets are going on sale on January 16th at noon Pacific time. The most important thing to know about the sale of the tickets is that they're happening in phases. Yeah. If you are an OG camper from 2022, VIP or GA makes no difference. Your tickets go on sale January 16th at 12 noon Pacific time. And they will be on sale just to you and that group of people for the first 48 Mm -hmm. hours. That's a Monday. That is a Monday. Then. After that, for the next 48, once your tickets are open, yeah, OG they, they campers, stay open. they stay open. You you can buy them endlessly. And you can buy as many as you want at a time. Also, that's been yeah. a big question that's been coming up. You can buy multiples. Yeah. Okay. Then, who comes next? Well, the patrons. Mm-hmm. Annabelle's, Roberts, Space Lizards, Bad Magicians. You guys get the next 48 hours before we open them up to everyone. Yep. Okay. So, I hope that all makes sense. Totally. So, Keep an eye on your emails. If you're a patron, keep an eye on the Patreon post. Yep. If you're an OG camper, keep an eye on your email and make sure that you are in the Facebook uh, summer camp group from last year. No sneaking in. We know <laughs> who was there. We're monitoring it. Don't try and be tricky. And then uh, and then once they're open for everybody, we'll be posting them on socials. They'll take yes. a link and we'll have it like in the episode description. We'll make it super easy. Super easy. And just as a reminder, last year, the first 300 tickets, over 300 tickets, sold out in less than two minutes. These yeah. tickets are going to sell out. So get there. Get them quickly. Be ready. Just let's like have the best time ever. Let's sell yep. this baby out. It's going to be amazing. You can do a, a, a payment plan this time, which we didn't have that option last year to make it easier coming out of the holidays. Yeah, it'll be a, a two payment payment plan. Mm-hmm. So that's very exciting. Um, and once you get to camp, everything is taken care of. It's like a cruise. It's all inclusive. Get yourself there and we've got everything else. We've yeah. got the lodging, the food, the activities, uh, meet and greets. I mean, we have so many things happening at camp. Yeah. Camp begins Thursday. September 21st and camp ends Sunday, September 24th. We're headed to the Poconos, 400 amazing acres mm-hmm. of fun, private lake, dodgeball, karaoke, <sighs> uh, yoga, trail hiking, Prosecco and painting, uh, challenge, co- like a ropes challenge course. So much. Tubing, you name it, we've got it. I, I dare you to come up with something we don't have. That's probably a challenge I don't want to present <laughs> to you guys. <laughs> uh, but if you were there last year, you are going to be blown away at the vast improvement to this year. Uh, we are so proud of what we did last year, mm-hmm. and we're excited to make it even better this year. And uh, the big marquee events will be a karaoke contest, which was just for VIPs last year. Yeah. It was the most fun thing. I don't give... Sounds so silly, but it was so fun. I don't give two hoots about karaoke yeah. at all. Generally speaking, not something I do. You couldn't get me off that stage last year. <laughs> In fact, me and our friend Joe DeMeo did the splits together yeah. during a Backstreet Boys song. It was especially epic. Uh, then we're going to have a comedy night featuring our very own Dan Cummins. Yep, Chad Daniels, Chad Kelsey Daniels Cook. is going to be there. Kelsey Cook, Harry Riley, mm-hmm. Doug Mellard, our MC from last year. All good friends, all amazing comics. Yep, for uh, the comedy show. Yeah, so that's going to be great. And then we w- are going to have, of course, a very awesome live scare to death. Mm-hmm. There will be meet Out in the woods. There will be meet and greet opportunities all weekend long with Dan and I. And of course, the art warlock himself, Logan yep. Keith, and the suck ranger mm-hmm. himself, Tyler C will be there so you can meet the whole team and 
as you can tell, we're just really excited. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be very awesome. And just go into the Camp No Counselors website. You can check out promo videos for their site. It's crazy. It's, it's just really, such a really, beautiful really cool. custom camp. Yeah, yeah. And then just as a little side note, guys, I know that we've been talking about our scholarship fund because of camp and a variety of things going on behind the scenes. We're just putting a pause in that and we'll be discussing the scholarship fund in February. Yeah. I know we said January. There's just too many things happening. We want to do it right. So stay tuned. February, we'll be talking about the scholarship. Yeah, that's my fault. I didn't realize. Yeah, I wasn't thinking that's about no how many fault. things we're pushing right now. It's okay. It's okay. We got a lot going on. We're busy people. And one more thing before we jump into the stories, just kicking off the year with a bang in the store, the Bad Magic store uh, with merch, incredible Valentine's card set. Oh, yeah. Featuring amazing spoopy illustrations. Each set contains 18 foldable Valentine's cards featuring six unique custom illustrations. You'll get a little Lindsay demon, a so little cute. me demon, a little boy demon, a little girl demon, lots Lost Soul Ghost, a baby goat, baby Baphomet, if you must. Oh, no. Uh, each set also comes with a sticker sheet, so you can close your Valentine just like we did in grade school. It's so cute. <laughs> if you don't uh, want these in Valentine form, uh, or, or you do, but also want some collectible art, we also have uh, available as mini canvases, these images. Yeah, they're really, really cool. Yeah, five by seven framed minis, perfect for a cool display at the home or office, and you, all this stuff is at badmagicmerch.com. Yes, the, or the art warlock was... So excited about these, yes. as was I. It's a very cool, very cool little custom uh, piece of merch. I love them. And now, Horror, thank and you now, for, for handling those announcements. Thank you for six minutes of announcements. <laughs> I know. I Sorry, know. We, guys. We try not to do that very often, but this is just a big deal for us. Uh, I want to tell you uh, what stories I'm about to tell you before uh, hearing what you have. How does that oh, sound? That seems rude, but fine. I want to preview my first. I have one lengthier story, really a collection of stories, and then one pretty short one. Maybe both are nothing more than urban legends, or maybe some Japanese monsters are real, and an Italian curse is also real. Uh, the first story I'll be sharing takes us to the Fukuoka, I was practicing this before the show. <laughs> you sure were. Prefecture of Japan, uh, the equivalent of a U.S. state, uh, to explore lore around the urban legend of the Howling Village. We'll look into some supposed history where a village is possibly forced into some isolationist tragedy, a supposed disappearance around a now abandoned tunnel near this village, a murder in another tunnel near this village, um, where uh, the village now sat, sits uh, submerged under a lake and more. Did an entire village become a true ghost town in the sense that you can't always see it, and it is definitely haunted, like that kind of ghost town? Uh, there's a lot to this one. And then we'll explore the odd legend of the Bassano Vase. Did this supposedly cursed object bring death to one owner after another for two separate cycles of death separated by centuries? Is it made up or does it lie underground again, waiting for a new owner to find it and start another cycle of horror? Now, what stories do you have? <sighs> Sorry, I'm just a little thrown. I'm just like so <laughs> used to going first. Just kidding. Uh, I have a real life Ouija board encounter tale. Okay. Uh, some friends get together and maybe they get into contact with something. The confirmation behind it is really like, wow, that's so creepy. Yeah. So concerning about what we might be able to tap into on the other side. And then my second story is, yes, a haunted house story, but it has a, a, a definite backstory. And yeah. um, again, more confirmation because multiple people are experiencing what's going on in this house. It's a Ouija board and haunted house. Mm -hmm. Classics. Specifically haunted basement. Haunted basement. Which, you know, we are all, all afraid of the basement. Totally. Uh, do you got your spoopy socks locked and loaded? I do. Look at these crocheted babies. Don't mind my, <laughs> my leg being the same color as my cream denim. You guys, these, <laughs> these babies haven't seen the sun in a while. Uh, I would like to think, I believe these are from fan Courtney Shimmons. They were in a bag and they were handed to me, I believe in Louisville. Uh, but... The dates are all blending together, and I hope I stuck the right note to <laughs> the right socks. Either way, very cute. Thank you so much, Courtney or someone else. All right. Plenty of time to settle in as I explain some backstory on this first one. Headed back to Japan for a strange collection of stories. Japan, a place has so many nice and spooky urban legends, and parts of this one have been around since the 90s, at least. While the overall truth of the legend itself is, of course, debatable, as is the case with all urban legends, it's at least based in some facts. Some interesting history and tragedy has at least occurred around the Inunaki Tunnel, or Howling Tunnel, and an old small village near it. Let's first examine the mysterious Inunaki Village, uh, loosely translated, of course, Howling Village, a place that no longer officially exists, largely underwater at the bottom of a reservoir. Unofficially, it is still rumored to exist in some kind of haunted, mystical form in the Fuka Fukuoka Prefecture. The small and easy-to-miss village was once located in the vicinity of Mount Inunaki near the Inunaki Mountain Pass. 
According to official historical records, this village was founded in the late 17th century and there was nothing abnormal about its formation. It was built to the site of some desired natural resources. Most jobs were based around producing ceramic products and steel manufacturing, just like with many other villages of the area. Later, a coal mine also established. In 1986, due to the construction of the Inunaki Dam, construction that would be completed in 1994, residents were moved to a nearby village and the old town was flooded. According to others, off the record, there was nothing normal about the formation of this village. And as I said, it's still there in a sense, just no longer a living village. As claimed by this other non-historical narrative, Inunaki Village was founded by some peasants who had chosen to live in exile and cut all bonds with society rather than live under a new government's oppressive regime back in the 17th century. And then within just a few years of its formation, the village was ravaged by disease. And to keep whatever sickness was there from spreading, regional authorities quarantined the area, prohibited anyone from entering or leaving the village. Even worse, goods were no longer allowed to travel in or out of the village. The villagers had been exiled, abandoned, and unable to move out of the area, essentially left to die. Authorities assumed that all the residents would soon perish from disease or abandonment, and once they had, the government could then open their land up again to use for whatever purposes they desired. But this didn't happen. Life in the trapped, isolated village did quickly descend into madness, into collective despair, followed by new horrors, but not everyone perished from disease. Villagers who didn't initially die soon fought each other over scraps of food, sometimes killing each other over limited resources. Neighbors turned on neighbors, families and friends turned on one another. And then with so few food sources now available to them, the dead quickly began to be cannibalized. Society devolved into a rough community of primitive hunters and foragers using crude tools to kill whatever game wandered into the area. As time went on, with no laws and a limited population that didn't provide normal dating options, things became incestuous. Morality crumbled. Relatives bred with relatives, soon creating people with a variety of deformities, such as abnormally shaped bodies and pale skin. People who had also never known a society that didn't revolve around brutality and crude basic survival. Over time, these people became more and more inhuman, essentially, eventually turning into monsters. They were monsters the rest of Japan had forgotten due to the rural isolation of the small village and the passing of time. On the rare occasion that someone did enter this remote and horrible place, they either disappeared or the remaining creatures there hid from them to avoid detection. According to this version of lore, sometime in 1970, a young couple was driving up the slopes of Inunaki Ridge near Howling Village, one of many creepy stories associated with this place that I am very excited to share with you. Time now for the tale of the horrors of the Howling Village. The couple were heading for the town of Hisayama on the other side of the mountain, and to get there from the small city of Miyawaka, they had to take a narrow road up the hill and then pass through the old Inunaki Tunnel. A new tunnel will be completed in 1975. Just before the tunnel, they heard a clunking sound from the car. Hoping to get just a bit further, maybe to a gas station or rest stop, they kept going. The clunking didn't seem that urgent, and they'd recently taken the car into the shop, and it had been running perfectly so far. But as they came out on the far side of the tunnel, the engine abruptly died, and the couple was stranded. Luckily, it was the middle of the day, or at least that seemed lucky at the time. It was, in fact, very unlucky because the weak green light filtering through the trees illuminated a small passage on the right side of the road, barely large enough for one person to walk through at a time. Had it been dark, maybe they never would have noticed this passage and been spared. Instead, figuring it was a shortcut to cut back towards town, they hadn't seen any other cars in the road and didn't want to wait around, they left their car and headed through this passage. And after a short while, they came across a handwritten sign. It read, the Constitution of Japan does not apply beyond this point. Oh. Both of them were confused. Was this some kind of joke? Who cared about the Constitution? The paper and writing on it both looked very old. Uh, but if it was old, how would, it have had, how would it have survived rainstorms and wind for decades? The trail was getting more difficult and overgrown as they continued. It seemed as if it didn't lead to any sort of civilization. But then a few hundred meters further in, they suddenly found themselves before a small village a village that had seen much better days. The few buildings around them were all squat and gray and seemed dilapidated. It was hard to imagine going inside one, much less living there. And even stranger, there were no sounds, no people or pets, no birds, not even bugs. It was dead silent. 
The pair continued to slowly venture into the village on what had become its main road, passing shadowy door frames and windows that creaked as the wind blew. Soon it became apparent that no one there would help them with their car. They hadn't even seen anyone yet, and if they were to run into anyone, this place didn't look like the kind of place that had electricity, much less a mechanic. They turned around to walk back to their vehicle. Hi there! An old man stood in front of them. He seemed to have materialized out of thin air. They never heard him approach. He stood under an arch that marked the entrance to the village. Across the arch were the words, Inunaki Village, Howling Village. Hi there! He shouted again. Welcome to Inunaki Village! The travelers were about to open their mouths to say something back, that they were just looking around and now were departing, when, with a few incredibly long and fast steps, the man was suddenly directly in front of the male traveler. We love visitors here, he said again. There was something scripted about his words, like he'd been practicing them for years, like he'd greeted many others the exact same way. He continued, We just don't like it when they leave us. Then, in a sudden and horrifying motion, he cut the young man <gasps> from his neck straight down to his belly with a sickle. The young man had no time to react. He just stared on in astonishment for a moment, his eyes wide, his brain not able to process what had just happened before he collapsed to the ground dead. The girl screamed and tried to back away, but the old man seized her in a firm grip. He seemed to have some internal force that made his hands and arms stronger than anything she'd ever felt before. With an almost inaudible groan, he lifted her straight up with one hand, threw her down on the gravel street with such brutality she felt her ribs break. When the sickle now came down upon her, she turned her head towards the closest house. With horror, she saw what they hadn't noticed before. Behind and between the small buildings, there were dead people. So many dead people. Decaying corpses all around. Or were they dead? The girl had no time to think before the sickle swished through the air and everything went black. And then no one ever found their remains. But now, when passing by the tunnel on misty nights... You might see their old white sedan on the side of the road covered with rust near a small pathway that leads into the forest. Many have since gone looking for this pathway to Inunaki village, and thus far all have been una unable to find it, at least all who have lived to share their finds. I guess there's a chance others who went exploring also could have become lost forever, but perhaps it's all nothing more than legend. The story of the young couple I just told is almost certainly nothing more than an urban legend since if they both died, how would we know what they experienced or merely thought in their final moments leading up to their deaths? Who would have been able to tell their story? While that part is certainly not true, still worth sharing because it's part of the legend and oh so creepy. But what about the rest of the story? Does this village of monsters, perhaps undead monsters, actually exist? If it does, not in any normal way. Google Earth would have certainly mapped it by now. Perhaps the village only exists at certain times, or can only be seen at certain times. Think of a ghost. They've never ever been continually visible for long stretches of time. They seem to flicker in and out of this world for very brief moments. Then they're lost back to wherever they came from, or at least hidden to us in some way. Just take that flickering concept and now apply it to an entire village. One other piece of lore that points towards this possibility is a phone booth. Near the dam and the big Inunaki Bridge is a phone booth a few, uh, just a hundred meters from where the real village once rested above water. And in this booth, uh, the phone supposedly rings at exactly 2 a.m. every night with a phantom call, a call from some undead entity still residing in Inunaki Village. If you answer this call, it is said that one of two things will happen. The now locked booth you will be unable to get out of will quickly begin filling up with water, simulating the village being flooded, and you will drown. Or a path will open up near the booth, more of a portal really, and if you travel through it, you can access the cursed village and have the most intense paranormal experience of your life, and likely your last paranormal experience. You will die, like in a, in a fashion similar to the young couple from the 70s. According to this urban legend, various villagers didn't randomly come down with some terrible disease and were then cruelly quarantined. They had started worshipping evil entities and had brought an unnatural terror into this world. They were... Uh, not diseased, they were possessed. Local authorities and religious leaders had to keep them in the village and away from other populations, killing them if necessary to contain the evil they'd unleashed and keep it from spreading. And now this evil still shows up in unusual ways, leading to disappearances, an alarming number of suicides from people throwing themselves off the nearby bridge and to all manners of supernatural terror. In addition to creepy lore concerning the village, there is also horror lore surrounding the old, abandoned, and now blocked off since 1975 tunnel, and the new tunnel 
built nearby to replace it. The original tunnel was built during and after World War II, probably using prisoners of war for their labor. It was completed in 1949. During its construction, an accident caused the tunnel roof to collapse, killing more than 100 workers. And now some think their ghosts haunt not only the old tunnel, but also the new one. These supposed ghosts made their way into another urban legend, one that is at least partially based in truth. On December 6, 1988, Kochi Imiyama was headed back from his nearby factory job, headed back home. He didn't like driving through the new tunnel. It always creeped him out, and he'd heard rumors that gangs sometimes hid in and around the tunnel and carjacked commuters. This night, he slowly entered the tunnel, keeping his eyes on the road in front of him and not on the walls that surround him. In the past, when he'd looked at the walls, he sometimes thought he'd seen faces floating around in the shadows, staring back at him from the darkness. He'd also sworn he'd seen these same faces when he left the tunnel and looked in his rearview mirror, faces watching him leave. When he made it through the tunnel this night, he breathed a sigh of relief, and while stopped at a stoplight, allowed himself a moment to relax. Tap, 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 tap! He jolted up and looked to his left. A face peered down beside him, and at first he thought it was like one of the faces in the tunnel, but this one was attached to a body, a living body, and it was scowling at him. Get out of the car! The man commanded him, pulling out a gun. No way, Kochi thought. He dealt with this. He dealt with enough in his life for a bunch of low lowlifes to steal his car from him. Bang! A shot pierced the glass, avoiding Kochi, but shattering his driver's side window. Before Kochi knew it, his hands were pulling him roughly out of his seat, dragging him out of his vehicle, and back into the tunnel. The last thing he saw before some gang members shot him were those faces inside the tunnel, smiling like they were happy to have him back. And then, darkness. Later that night, the gang members set his body on fire and fled the scene. The story became a media sensation and eventually all the perpetrators would be arrested. After a trial in 1991, they would all be sentenced to life in prison where they remain now. But are all the details of this story true? Possibly. Not likely. How do we know what he thought he saw at the end of his life? We might not. The paranormal aspects around his death could be entirely fictitious or perhaps he did say something and then his killers shared that with investigators. True, half-true, or outright lies, after Kochi's death, the dark energy around the Inunaki Tunnel did seem stronger than ever. In the decades since, many people have reported hearing screams and crying children from within the tunnel. And from outside, people say voices are begging you to follow them in. For those in cars, it doesn't appear to be much safer. People report finger and handprints appearing on their windows and windshields after passing through the tunnel, as though invisible people were trying to hold on to them or force their way inside. In February of 2020, the Fuka, uh, Fukuoka Broadcasting Corporation sent a small group of journalists who, with the authorization of the Miyawaka City Council, approached the old Inunaki Tunnel from the Miyawaka side. On that side, to the northeast, the tunnel is sealed all the way to the tunnel roof, and you cannot enter. Despite not being able to get inside while merely standing in front of the tunnel, they registered a drop in temperature from 12 degrees Celsius to 9 degrees near the tunnel opening. In just a few feet, the air became markedly colder. In Fahrenheit, that's over a 5 degree drop uh, over just a few feet. And the cold air felt different, foreboding. Like the other visitors, this group also said they heard strange noises coming from inside the tunnel. But no one could agree exactly what those noises were. Some said it was the voices of children playing. Others seemed to be convinced that it was someone in trouble and that they should go help them. One man allegedly even seemed to go temporarily insane and tried climbing over the barricade and had to be restrained. Still others started crying and were unable to explain themselves. While this group didn't actually enter the tunnel, many others have. I watched some videos on YouTube of people doing some illegal exploration. You now have to trespass on government land to even make it into the tunnel. All the videos I watched were of people exploring during the day and none of them reported anything more than just feeling really creeped out. But the following story comes from someone who allegedly dared to enter the tunnel alone at night, or planned on it, at least. If they're telling the truth, they experienced way more than a creepy feeling, and may have added another dark possibility to the horror lore that this area is immersed in. 21-year-old Jiro had heard about the original Inunaki Tunnel for years before he decided to explore it himself. A die-hard horror fan, He'd grown up on films like Ringu and the Saw franchise, so the idea of a haunted tunnel possibly connected to some mysterious, terrifying village of the undead was darkly appealing. Everyone he talked to online or in real life who'd been to the tunnel said it was decidedly creepy. No one he knew had found the village, though. 
Jiro was pumped to explore it, but then super bummed out when he got there and discovered that you seemingly couldn't get inside. It looked to be entirely blocked off. Shit, he said out loud, even though no one else was around. He told his parents that he was borrowing their car to go hang out and watch a movie with some friends. Now he was annoyed with himself for lying and risking getting in trouble, all for nothing. As he looked around for some way to sneak into the tunnel, had he known the other side was accessible, he could have wandered through the forest to get there. His eyes caught on a manhole cover, and it was a little bit askew. No, Jiro told himself, that would be an insanely stupid idea, to climb into a manhole that in all likelihood, based on its location, did not lead into the tunnel anyway. Who knows where it led? But then he thought, what if it led to someplace even creepier than the tunnel? What if it was somehow connected to that village? If he explored, he might end up with an even better story than anyone he'd ever communicated with who had been in this haunted area. But he was scared. He was definitely very scared. He was alone. It was getting dark. What if there were not ghosts down beneath that manhole, but people, bad people? Who would hear him cry for help if they heard him? Who would witness him being attacked and try and stop anything they might want to do to him? No one. He paused and thought about calling the whole thing off and killing some time when he was supposed to be watching a movie and hanging with friends and then returning home. No, he thought. He'd made the effort to come here. Don't stop now. Why would anyone be hiding down there? He asked himself. Also, there was no obvious fresh footsteps around the manhole or anything. He certainly didn't hear anyone else around. He decided to be brave. Or stupid. Or both. And to go for it. Helping his decision, he felt pulled towards opening the cover. Like he was supposed to go in. It took all of Jiro's strength to push the manhole lid far enough aside for him to be able to slip past it. Using his phone flashlight, he saw a rusty ladder leading down to a dirty slab of concrete. It looked moldy, also exactly like something you'd see in a horror video game. The thought of telling his friends about what he was doing excited him, and he took a short video of it all and then climbed down. When his feet hit the ground, the smell of where he now was was heavy. A thick, musty scent of stagnant water, the sour scent of mold, and a layer of dust over everything. This must be what a tomb smells like, he thought. Well, minus the decaying bodies. Hopefully, minus the decaying bodies. That thought made him shiver. He took another quick video to document what he was seeing, and then slowly, he moved forward. After about 10 seconds of walking, if his sense of direction was correct, he was now right under the old tunnel. So it did lead towards the tunnel. Still walking through the narrow passage, his vision limited to the illuminated circle his phone's flashlight made, all he saw ahead of him was more dirty black concrete, and all he heard was his own footsteps and puddles of water on the ground. And then, plip, plip, plip. Water was dripping somewhere ahead, but Jiro didn't know how far ahead. Space felt weirdly compressed, as though he was walking for ages but managed to get only a few feet. Or was it the reverse? Was he moving too quickly? He was thinking about all this when something moved in the corner of his vision. He spun around, shining his flashlight on the wall, but couldn't see anything. As he moved further forward, he felt now like he saw something scurry just past the edge of his vision again. He snapped his head around and saw nothing. But then more movement, maybe, in his peripheral vision. This kept happening again and again. He was starting to get jumpy, on the edge of running back, climbing out of the tunnel and speeding home. Was he alone? Just working himself up? Whenever he quickly shot his flashlight over the direction of movement, there was nothing to be seen at all. So he just kept marching forward. He was so focused on trying to definitely see something and not freak out if he didn't that he didn't notice at first when he'd stumbled into a large circular room. Now he scanned it with his flashlight, taking in the entrances to other tunnels that lined the walls. Whoa, where was he? And then he saw the figure in the center of the room staring at him with blank, wide eyes. On the edge of either falling down breathless or screaming, jerking his flashlight around in startled terror, it took him a moment to realize that the figure was nothing more than a statue. And he let out a nervous laugh. <laughs> Jeez, Jiro. But then quickly his feeling of relief ebbed away. Why was this statue down here? Why was there a human-sized one? Who would take this down here? At first, it seemed like a statue of a normal person, but as Jiro examined further, he saw that some of its features were exaggerated, as though from malnutrition, ribs sticking out, its face a ghastly skull-like mask, its smile weirdly aggressive. And it was deformed in some ways, one arm larger than the other, one shoulder too high, the hips crooked, the knees pointed towards one another. Why make a statue of a starving, crippled man? And it wasn't standing up like a regular statue would have been. It was sort of hunched over like it was about to spring into a run. So weird, Jiro thought. If some prankster had moved this thing down here to try and freak people out, well, it was working. 
Stealing himself, he made a video to document the statue and which tunnel he'd just come down so he could find his way out. And then he resumed his way forward, choosing a tunnel to go in almost at random. As he entered and then the ceiling closed in on him again, Jiro swept his flashlight around the tunnel walls. A plus M forever, read some graffiti. Another in a different hand and color just read, this is gross. He laughed a bit. And then another piece of graffiti caught his eye. It was harder than the others to make out, like the person had a shakier hand or maybe wasn't totally literate. Go back, not nice. What did that mean? He didn't like the sound of this one, not at all. Maybe some sort of old warning for the people who built the tunnel? Maybe it was dangerous down here? His gut told him that wasn't it, though. His mind flashed on the statue. Somehow, it was related. Again, Jiro walked on, though, and now he saw the same warning. First, he saw it down by his left foot, then again up above him. Soon was almost everywhere he swept his flashlight. Go back, not nice. Go back, not nice. Go back, not nice. Progressing even further, all the letters were smeared beyond recognition so Jiro couldn't see what they said. It looked like they were written by different people in different colors. Some of the words old and faded. Some looked fresh. Clang! Jiro gasped as the sound echoed through the tunnels. It sounded like it was coming from the main room a ways back. But from what Jiro had seen, there hadn't been anything that would make that sound. No pipes, nothing precariously stuck to the walls. Was there another thrill seeker with him now? Some thug? Or maybe he thought, oh God. Had someone just closed the manhole? Oh, fuck, he said. And then he yelled as loud as he could as he started running back. Someone's down here! Someone's down here! Don't cover it! His footsteps echoed in the tunnel and then abruptly stopped when he reached the main chamber. He hadn't meant to stop running. It was just the statue. He guessed it surprised him again. Something about his face, the deep, gnarled frown, and the body bent back unnaturally. Wait a second, Jiro thought. Hadn't the statue been crouching before and smiling? Was it a statue? As if sensing his thoughts, the statue's head turned to face him, and it fucking blinked. Jiro screamed. It opened his mouth in a smile to reveal a very pink, very alive interior. Jiro started running, not knowing for sure what tunnel he picked. If it was even the right one that led to the surface. He grabbed his phone with the flashlight still on his sweaty hand, the light bouncing off the walls. He ran as he, as he swore he saw, and flashes of light faces peering at him. Floating faces that looked human, but somehow not. Faces that looked at him like a predator looks at his prey. And Jiro could not only see them, he could hear them. Please, please stay. It's nice here. Please stay with us. We're nice. He could hear a clanging behind him, too, a short distance away. Whatever that thing was, it was chasing him. He ran harder than he'd ever ran before. It's nice. We're nice. The tunnel kept curving as he ran right back into the large circular room where the creature he thought once was a statue was. And now something sped past his flashlight. He jumped back, waved the light around everywhere, desperately trying to find it. If he found it, maybe he'd be able to run in the opposite direction or fight it. Maybe he'd live. Just then a cold, clammy hand brushed the back of his neck, and Jiro screamed, dropping his phone. In the darkness, he now ran as best he could, with one arm brushing the wall alongside him, the other in front to reduce the risk he'd run headfirst into a wall. He entered another tunnel, not knowing if it was the right one. He had to keep moving, anything to put distance between him and whatever that thing was. To his relief, this tunnel did not lead him right back into the big circular room again. It was the right one. He saw the manhole cover, the rusty circle of light above him. Someone had moved it, but they'd left him with a chance to escape. It was almost entirely covered, just a thin thread of light seeping in from the outside. Jiro was determined to make it. He boosted himself up the ladder and soon put his hands against the manhole and pushed with all his might and slipped, almost <gasps> fell back down to the ground to what would have certainly been his death. This thing was close. His backpack knocked him off balance, so he tossed it down the ladder and tried again. Slowly, the manhole loosened and he climbed to the surface as he felt something start to climb up beneath him. He ran over to his car. Thankfully, it started up immediately, and he threw it into reverse, sped back, whipped it around, and drove the fuck out of there. In the rearview mirror as he sped away, he swore he saw in the moonlight that manhole cover slide back and close the hole. That thing, the statue thing, must have moved it from below. Now he raced home, knowing he'd get a lot, of, knowing he'd get in a lot of trouble for losing his phone, the backpack, all that was inside it, and he didn't care. He was alive, and he did have the best horror story of anyone he knew. Shaking with adrenaline, fear, and relief, he burst out laughing. He cackled like a crazy person as he drove away from the Howling Tunnel and possibly the actual entrance to the Howling Village, and a very close call with one of its cursed and terrifying residents. My God. Mm -hmm. Tunnels are so scary. 
Yeah. I hate tunnels. I hate driving through them. Like just, just the, as soon as you started talking about tunnels, I was like, oh, this isn't good. Yeah. I, I found when I was uh, looking for pictures of this story, I found like a, a list of haunted places in Japan. Yeah. And there's a variety of haunted tunnels over there. Yeah. And actually, uh, it was a little comforting just as far as uh, for the show, as far as story fodder. It led me to other lists. Yeah. And I, didn't, I don't know why after all this time, didn't even think of just checking like Wikipedia. Uh, like as far as like haunted places around the world. Yeah. So many. Haunted it, tunnels? Uh, tunnels, but just everything. Tunnels, houses, you know, castles, sites, random stuff. I was just blown with hundreds and hundreds of things. And I didn't recognize almost any of them. Oh. So we had a lot of future stories. Okay. I don't. I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I think that story got you a little bit, huh? Yeah, you just it, it was so um the I, I like the way you told it. Uh just like, you know, maybe this is true, maybe this is not. This is, you know, probably solely yeah. folklore. It was like a nice build up to uh Euro story. Yeah. What was his name? Uh Jiro. 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 Yeah. And then it just felt uh yeah, the details, I was really able to picture it. And I feel like, you know, in so many movies, I, yeah. I mean, honestly, I was like in like Laura Croft Tomb Raider or like ah, yeah, yeah, in yeah. Game of Thrones. It's like tunnels are such a common, scary place to be, even in a non-horror movie, just in an action movie. Totally. Because you don't know where you're going. You don't know where it leads. And it just felt really um, tangible mm. in my brain. I don't know. Good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have some pictures. Okay. Uh, this first one is a movie poster for 2019's Howling Village. Oh, okay. Have you seen that? Nope, I have not. It's a Japanese horror film. Uh, well, the, the original title when released in Japan was Inunaki Mura or Inunaki Village. Well, how did you check the reviews? Horror movie reviews are always you know, a bit dicey. They're a bit dicey. I mean, it, it was pretty good. So I feel like it could be a good movie, you know, like, uh, and I've watched horror movies that critics destroy. Of course. That I really liked. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't feel like you can go off critics. I watched a trailer for it and it, the trailer spooked the shit out of me. Okay. I love Japanese horror, just like the the kind of images they use. Yeah. And the way they build tension. But they and, don't hold back. No, and it's like, yeah, it tends to be like, uh, I don't know, just like the type of move it i was reading some like somebody describing like the difference between japanese horror cinema and american cinema and they'll use like uh, more tension in a lot of japanese horror like the the villains in american horror movies tend to be more active mm, like really mm -hmm. coming at you a lot of like chase and they will do that in japanese horror too but there's more moments of them just like standing there watching uh, it just like they just keep building the tension or like showing up in a window showing patient. up in a mirror yeah it feels like more patient storytelling yeah yeah and then this uh this next one aerial shot of the dam bridge and reservoir that submerged the real inunaki village so pretty yeah, it is pretty. I always forget. I think of Japan being so urban. I know. I forget that it's so green. Mm -hmm, that there's huge chunks of like very rural areas, you know, heavily forested mountains. And yeah. Is that a bridge? Sort of that like there was like a yeah. red line. Okay. Yeah, there was a bridge down below. Oh, that red line was, um, I think, just like a, a, a lot, power line or something, you uh, know, to okay. make sure planes don't hit it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I was like, wow, that's an impressive <laughs> yeah, I think. an impressive arc of a bridge going over a huge body of water. Yeah, because closer to us, that bridge below, unfortunately, there is a, a, a very high amount of suicides on that bridge, that Inunaki oh. Bridge. Um, and then this next one is the phone booth. There is that real phone booth there that actually was featured in that movie, The Howling Village, um, that supposedly the lower two the two AM phone calls and all that. Uh this next picture, the mostly blocked off entrance to the original Inunaki tunnel. Would uh, you go in? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Like during the day, honestly. No, not a chance in hell. <laughs> yeah. I, where we live, uh, for people who aren't in this area, there's the the Hiawatha Trail. And mm, it's this like really mm -hmm. beautiful, you uh, you rent bikes and you, you know, ride through this like huge tunnel and it has yeah. all this history. But even that tunnel, you're going with a group. Usually you're with like 20, 30 people. Uh, you have headlamps, uh -huh. the whole thing. I hate it so much much it is creepy it is so creepy and there's nothing there's nothing to be scared of in that instance it's yeah. the middle of the day you can see sunshine behind you and in front of you for the majority of the ride through the tunnel again yeah. you're with a bunch of people you're on a bicycle like there's no there's truly no reason to be scared and yet i'm scared every time yeah my brain goes to like cave-ins oh my, yeah my, my brain goes to like maniacs who like block off the tunnel on each oh side my god <laughs> you just, you just you're be stuck so in trapped. there you're killing each other yeah that's no, terrifying <laughs> and uh, i will say that Euro, Jiro, yeah. yeah, Jiro, a little, yeah, a little bit of a Darren, yes, just like yes. kept going. I'm like, you're an idiot. <laughs> uh, two more pictures. This oh, next, sorry. That's, that's okay. This next one's a pick of inside the tunnel. Um, now is that 
I don't know if you know this, but what we see at the back is that the other opening? Yeah, like I th- it's not I a very so. long not, tunnel. Not, not very long. Yeah, filled with trash. Yep, just a bunch of graffiti and stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, and the ground is filthy. Yes, and then this last picture, just a creepy still image from the cool. Howling Village movie. Right. Oh wow. Okay, wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Oh, that yeah, is yeah, yeah. creepy. That is. Oh God, that is so creepy. Mm-hmm. That's a, that is a good depiction that fits the description of like you know deformed like things are uh-huh. just like off about the face like one eye is yep. larger like one yep. pupil is larger than the other the um the sort of blood. like a smashed nose mm-hmm. like almost looks like the upper lip is missing or yep. just like very 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 thin blood on the lower lip where she's been probably eating somebody yeah, yeah it's yeah, like yeah. gone it's like gone okay <laughs> <I'm> not <laughs> did not like that image at all okay and and that was just so you know that was the much longer sh- uh story my next story is a little baby story <laughs> i love it like you're like and that was a short story and now you talk for three <laughs> hours no. uh i did i was reminded of a story that i believe that you told and then i told a fan story version of the same uh a tunnel in i believe colorado where it's like maybe a school bus do you remember this it was like a school bus was going through a tunnel the tunnel collapses and a, a fair amount of children are trapped and die inside this school bus and yeah, then it does pe- sound familiar and then people now some people say it's urban legend other mm-hmm. people say no it absolutely happened like there's you know two yeah. sides to the t- to the coin and the fan story what i recall of the fan story is that these friends went to try and figure out like you know what would happen or you know was the legend true and you drive your car into the tunnel and i think you're supposed to turn it off or at least turn off your lights and then they heard sort of like a pound 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 oh yeah and then when they came out of the tunnel there were little hands handprints all over the car so creepy so creepy mhm ay are you ready to leave japan and head to italy take me out of japan okay the basano vase there's a handcrafted silver vase from the 15th century. I'm sorry, is it Passano with a P? Uh, B. Bassano. Oh, B. Bassano. Okay, Bassano. thank you. Yeah. Uh, made in a small village north of Naples, or Napoli. Uh, originally meant to be a gift for a young bride, it was delivered anonymously the night before her wedding, and she saw it as a blessing, a good omen for her future marriage. Strongly assuming anyone listening knows that it was not. Not much of a horror story if it was wonderful. <laughs> Time now for the tale of the death vase. I just have to acknowledge before I get into it and get to the scares, uh, very hard for me not to laugh at the title of the death face, which is what it's called in certain websites. Uh, to me, death face sounds like a really bad pulp horror movie from the 70s. <laughs> like your career is in the toilet if you used to be in like big theatrical productions and now you're in the death face. It sounds like a movie Nicolas Cage would have done when his career was in the <laughs> yeah, is up. I know. I had a little thing like head to your local video store this Friday if you're brave enough to watch the death face starring Charles Bronson and Liza Minnelli. Or maybe starring DJ Honey. <laughs> <laughs> DJ, yeah. It's my, my movie trailer voice too. Um, okay, now that that's out of my system. Okay. I can move forward and try to get into this. <laughs> According to one version of the legend surrounding the Bassano vase, just a few hours after the bride took the vase into her home, she was murdered. When the bride never showed up to her wedding ceremony, her family, of course, immediately went searching for her, and they found her dying on her bedroom floor, holding the vase in her hands. She vowed that she would get revenge and then passed away, still tightly gripping the now cursed vase. No one seems to know who killed her or why, who she wanted to exact some revenge upon. Another version of this story reports that the bride was found dying of a mysterious illness and not from an attack. Both versions end with her holding the vase in her dying moments, vowing to return after death. After the young woman's death, the vase was passed down to family members, and they would soon learn that anyone who owned the vase was seemingly cursed to die. Again, according to one version of the legend of this allegedly cursed object, after several vase owners died unexpectedly, someone in the family finally realized that the Bassano vase was the common denominator likely cause of all their pain they boxed the vase up gave it to a local priest to be exercised blessed and or cleansed after telling him of of its history hoping to never see it again and they didn't see it again the priest buried the vase deep in the woods never telling anyone where it was according to another version the vase was not given to a priest but instead a family member was tasked with the misfortune of burying the vase five centuries then passed with the vase hidden and it seemed like the vase was forgotten and lost to time But in 1988, a young Italian man dug up the same vase in his backyard. He supposedly picked up the vase and found an odd note inside it. Beware, this vase brings death. The man decided to auction off the vase, hoping to make some easy money from his discovery, and he did. The Bassano vase sold for more than $2,000. 
and the auctioneers failed to inform the buyer about the cryptic note. A successful pharmacist purchased the vase, excited to add a historic piece of art to his collection, but he wouldn't be able to enjoy it for long. Although described as being in the prime of his life with no health issues, he died just three months later of an unexplained illness. Then the three subsequent owners of the Bassano vase also proceeded to meet untimely ends. The first victim was a 37-year-old surgeon with no health issues. The pharmacist's family, not realizing the vase was cursed, sold the vase to the surgeon, who then died suddenly less than two months later of also a mysterious illness. The vase now bought by an archaeologist, who then died just two months later of a mysterious illness. The archaeologist's family now sold the vase to yet another man who also became very sick soon after purchasing the vase. No doctor could diagnose or treat him. This time, he died just one month after bringing the vase into his home. A member of this man's family, after learning more about the vase and putting together its deadly history, got so angry, he threw the vase out of a window. The vase almost hit a police officer in the head who picked up the somehow unbroken wedding gift, marched up to the owner's apartment, gave the family a ticket for littering. <laughs> they paid the fine, but refused to take the vase back, instead insisting that the officer take it with him when he left. The police officer now offered the vase to a local museum, but no museum in town would accept it despite its beauty and historic value. Its deadly legend had now become known to everyone in the area. The officer now decided to hide it, and he either buried it in an unknown location in the woods or in a cemetery to ensure it would never be found and dug up again, and it hasn't been seen since. Is the legend of the Bosano vase uh, just a centuries-long series of tragic coincidences, a coincidence, oh my god, coincidences? Or is it actually cursed? Or did it ever even exist? There is only one blurry picture of the Bassano vase. This whole story may be nothing more than an early version of horror fiction passed down through the centuries. There are no names or dates given for any of the people involved. But if the Bassano vase is real, there is a chance that its story is not over. Some unsuspecting archaeologist or historian hundreds, maybe even thousands of years from now, may discover it and start up another cursed cycle of death all over again. How much would that suck? <laughs> yeah. Especially as an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. I just imagine that like, oh my God, I found this incredible piece of history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then dead, and then everyone who takes it dead. Dead, dead, dead. Uh, uh, but what a fun way to kill somebody you don't like. True. Just give him this face. Just like a, Take it. A gift. Act of kindness. Ooh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what a crazy white elephant uh, a gift. Oh my God. If you're a real risk taker and uh, yeah. sociopath. I, like, I have a few people I wouldn't mind handing that vase to. <laughs> uh, a few pictures. This first one is the Bassano vase. Uh, the only picture you can find, there's different versions of this picture. It's like not even that special. You have just a silver, old silver vase. Um, here's another vase. Not cursed, just thought you would like it. It's beautiful. Uh-huh. There's a nice vase. There's a beautiful... I really like the base of that vase. It's like really like solid it's, it's and solid. sturdy. Mm -hmm. and it's heavy. I, I like the shape of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very nice. Uh, here's another vase. Again, not cursed. I was, I was just drawn to this one. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I also really enjoy this one. I mean, the very color floral. is very vibrant. Mm -hmm. uh, the floral shape is very nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then one more vase just again that, you know, I thought you would enjoy. Is that on one of our desks? <laughs> Uh, no, but we do have a vase very similar to that in the office. This this one's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a nice um, curves. Nice curvy vase. Yeah. Nice curvy vase. Mm -hmm. You can find all these pictures on uh, Scared to Death Podcast <laughs> uh, on Instagram <laughs> yeah. and Facebook. If you're curious. If you're curious what exactly is happening right now. If you're a vase connoisseur. Don't show your kids. If you're... <laughs> cautious about those things <laughs> if you're prudish if, if it's not appropriate for their age <laughs> <laughs> oh boy you are a troublemaker oh man okay you had a lot of story this week i did yeah i should i should have uh i did forget to mention that before yeah it was longer oh, I, I just wish i would have peed sooner <laughs> oh no <laughs> Uh, everything's gonna be fine you guys can I'm, you make it of course i can okay i'm a professional dan okay unlike some people <laughs> you have to stop the show. No, Dan was having a coughing attack. We started to record and then we just stopped and started over. Yeah. Because, you know. I didn't drink enough water. Mm -hmm. And now I also have to pee. But I know. But, but I'll I, be good. I'll I, be men good. I mentioned that when you were like, I just need to chug a ton of water. I was like, well, this isn't going to go well. He's going to get real antsy about one minute into my stories. Nope, I'm good. You're good? Yep. Who's your Layla this week? I have uh, the Black Layla. Black Layla? Mm-hmm. I do love that one. She's right. the most voodoo looking with the white eyes. You do? Yeah. Oh, 
Okay. All right. Well. And there's a little, a little side, not a Layla, but a little. Um, oh God, what's that guy? Little Grim Reaper. Where did uh, he come from? He's from. Uh, he was over in our pile of squishies, but he's from the. Um, oh my gosh, those movies. Scream. Scream. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I knew. I knew what he was from. I. I just meant like, where did we get him? I had. I don't seen know. Him. Okay, well, thanks, friends. I did see that uh, a new box of Laylos came in for our Layla oh gosh, army. That's I amazing. love it so much. It makes you me guys so are happy. The best. You guys are so fun. Okay, well, are you ready to talk Ouija boards? I am. What's your current status on Ouija boards? Like, sometimes you're like, oh, I would totally do it. Other times you say not. I mean, I know personally, I'm out on Ouija boards. Right now, I'm afraid of them. Right now, you're afraid of them. How come? Mm, well, I don't want to. I don't want to deviate the show, but we did uh, do a big psychedelic reset, mm -hmm. and reality is still like <laughs> things are still a bit bendy yeah they're, they're, like i'm not tripping or anything like that but i need a few more days for reality to like really solidify mm. which i know makes me sound like a crazy person um <laughs> i feel like everything's very crisp right now mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and i just I like it um, my brain is more open to like who knows what kind of possibilities okay it's probably because so, you saw some interesting things recently mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so like the the ouija board i just i'm not ready like last night i didn't even tell you I kept waking up and I went to go use the bathroom upstairs. Yeah. The the ship's bathroom when I was tripping. Uh -huh. Not a ship uh, last night, but you had, remember the light in Kyler's room was on? Yes. It, it, it was not, nothing weird, but that got into my head. Okay. And when I went up there, I was, and I had such a specific image of this dude in our house and he was so, I can picture him now and it gives me the chills. And it's not, it doesn't, doesn't look like anyone I've ever seen before. So creepy. And I had to get some antacid stuff out of the um, little pantry in that bathroom. And I was convinced he was right behind me when I was doing that. And I had to like talk myself off the ledge. Like, don't look. He's not there. It's not real. Just get your stuff. Go to bed. What did he look like? Like um, straight, sandy blonde hair, probably like mid thirties, uh -huh. bigger eyes, um, dark colored eyes, lighter skin. Sorry, uh, I came over to your house last night. <laughs> 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 Logan had a sleepover. He was, um, I don't know, taller, thin. I think I know what, what? it was. I think I know what's happening in your brain. We've been reading a lot about the recent arrest. I know that Brian Koberger. Yeah, the Moscow murder. And that is not that. He didn't look like him, but I kind of saw some similarities. Yeah, that's not that far yeah. off, especially like if you really start reading all the articles, there are like some older pictures of him when he was younger and yeah. that's not that far off. And you had mentioned that when we were having our psychedelic reset, that was popping up a little bit for you because totally. it's in your psyche, yep. right? It's like yep. you can't help but have what yeah. you absorb in your day-to-day -day life show up. So right now, I'm just not in a great mental space mm -hmm. for a Ouija board. Okay. Because I think my imagination is too heightened. I think that tonight, yeah. we should cleanse the house. Just do like a nice mm. smoke cleansing. Yeah. Just You should put some crystals under your pillows <laughs> for sound sleep. Right. And I, I think you'd be surprised at how good you'll feel. Okay. You can resalt all the doorways. And uh, I can mist you in some cleansing spray. And you'll be okay. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that you had that happen. Yeah, all right, it's all right. right. All right. Well, it'll at least set you up for a great Ouija board story. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's do it. Dan and Lindsay. Here is an absolutely true story with a Ouija board. My memory has faded with age, much like my hair, but I remember the details of this night like high school was yesterday. And to this <laughs> day, it still gives me legit shivers of fear and loathing. My sophomore year in high school, a good friend of mine was dating a senior. He was no Don Juan, but somehow he managed to swing this relationship for several months. One cold winter night, he and I were invited to his girlfriend's house with one of her good friends. The house was out in the boonies on a dark wooded lot. Her parents were gone, and her friend was cute, and she was also a senior. Score! Except I had absolutely no game. My friend and his girlfriend were messing around with the Ouija board in the basement while her friend and I watched from the couch. Picture orange shag carpet lime green beanbag chairs and very dim 1970s style crappy lamps oh and a weird color changing lava lamp her friend lindsay didn't want anything to do with the ouija board my friend and his girlfriend suggested that we try to contact lindsay's brother who had recently passed away in a motorcycle accident i thought it was kind of rude but i was young and a bit out of my depth hanging out with these girls who would be going to college in the fall <laughs> so i just kept my mouth shut and went along with it idiot. Lindsay said it was okay, but did not want to be involved. Lindsay was all of a sudden very interested in me. Lots of flirty eye contact, asking me questions about myself. Sadly, she didn't even remember my name, though. She was just avoiding what was going on with the board, glancing nervously at it every once in a while. 
our friends were on the floor with the board between them. They were now insisting they had gotten through to Lindsay's brother. They were asking questions and getting answers. Lindsay was trying not to listen, covering her head with a pillow, and was obviously uncomfortable. They were talking, they were all asking questions of yes and no. I started paying more attention to the board more than Lindsay. Are you dead? Yes. Are you in heaven? No answer. Are you scared? Long pause. Yes. Ugh. Are you alone? No answer. Are you alone again? No. Are there spirits around you? Long pause. Yes. Are you in this room with us? Yes. Are they in this room with us? Yes. Holy shit. Shiver shot up my spine and Lindsay was now watching the board more closely. Are you angry? Which I thought was a stupid question and asking for trouble. Long pause. Then spelled out getting there. Oh shit. Why are you angry? Long pause. Then gibberish letters that I wish I could remember. We tried later to remember them and figure out a meaning, but we never did. Probably for the best. Who knows what that could have been. Do you want us to stop? The planchette moved very suddenly to yes. Lindsay was freaking out. She'd finally had enough and asked them to stop. How did they even know it was her brother? It could be any spirit out there. Rather than respecting her wishes, they pushed on and asked the spirit to prove that it was her brother. It was so weird. Lindsay put her hands over her ears and she leaned closer and looked at the board through squinted eyes like she was ready to close them quickly. T. U. L. L. Lindsay screamed, holy crap. I almost jumped out of my skin. She jumped up and bolted out of the room, wailing as she ran. The three of us stared blankly at each other. None of us understood the shocking and crazy reaction. Her friend got up and went after her. We waited in silence for several long minutes. Eventually, she came back into the room without Lindsay, and her face was white, Ugh. like scared to death white with tears in her eyes. And she said we needed to go. Lindsay wasn't coming back out, and we just needed to go. We asked for an explanation a couple of times as we walked through the house to leave, but she didn't respond at all until we were at the door with our coats on. She finally broke down crying. In a shuddering voice, she explained that when Lindsay's brother was still alive, he was captivated by one rock band, Jethro Tull. I walked out into the dark and cold Wisconsin night shivering, but not from the cold. I never saw a Ouija board again. Not that I avoided it. It just didn't happen. I wonder if I would try it again now. I love to be scared, movies, haunted houses, stories, and this podcast. But my wife would never let me near one if she knew there was one close by. She'd lose her shit, and probably for good sense. Anyways, awesome job, you two. Keep it up. I'm sure lots of these stories are made up or exaggerated. Not this one for sure. But your suspension of skepticism and acceptance of the possibility of the reality is the magic and mystery that conveys the shivers. And mm. if only one story is true... Sean. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Uh, one question. I'm sorry if I missed this, but the Lindsay in there, that her brother died. Yeah. She didn't have her hand on the planchette, mm -mm. right? Okay. I thought no. so, which is what made the TUL so much creepier because she leaned forward and squinted her eyes to see what was happening. Yeah. But she wasn't so... She she, she 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 couldn't have pushed it to those letters. Right. She couldn't have spelled out T-U-L-L -T -U -L -T -U -L -L yeah. in an attempt to like make it make the confirmation <laughs> totally, totally. true. And how That's could... These other two people even have known who her brother's favorite band was. Right. Yeah. It was such a random reference. Very specific. Very specific. But that I, was fucking creepy. That was a great story. Just the progression of what that thing the board was saying mm -hmm. was so pretty creepy. Yeah. Yee. I love it because it, I mean, on Excuse the one me. hand, it excites me because it makes me think maybe you really can get in touch with people, like your people from the other side. But then what always makes it so scary is that it's like, yeah, it might be your person or it might mm -hmm. be someone moonlighting mimicking. as your person. Yeah, yeah. Mo mimicking. I thought they said moonlighting. Like what? Like a their second job. job. Their second job. <laughs> their, main, their main job is demon and their second job is brother impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> they were, they weren't, they're not making enough money as demon to pay their hell bills. <laughs> <laughs> so they got moonlight. <laughs> Just picture some frustrated God. demon. I'm so sick of working two jobs. This is bullshit. I can hardly make my rent. <laughs> <laughs> well, ah. I had to take a gig on Death Vase <laughs> to make some extra money. <laughs> Creepy Wait, demon number three. Death Vase. I want you to know that when you were speaking earlier, I heard Death Face. 
Oh, death face? Yeah, and I was like, how? Death face. I know. I'm like, why did he say death face? This summer to VHS, death face. That's why I thought it would be a great Nick Cage movie. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> ah, okay, you ready for one more? Mm-hmm. Okay. Haunted, house, basement, situation, mm-hmm. little kid, lasts a long time. Okay. Confirmation from dad. Okay. Okay, here we go. Mm-hmm. Hey there, king of the creeps and queen of the peeps. For this story, we're jumping back to when I was five and moving my childhood bedroom down the 13 stairs, I kid you not, to the basement. Lindsay, grab your crystals, and Dan, hopefully this will get a yeek out of you. (laughs) When I was about five years old, my parents wanted to knock down the wall to my childhood room and merge the two rooms together to create more space. Recently, my dad had started to put up some dry, dry wall and better light fixtures in the basement to make it feel more finished. However, it still had textured concrete floors and mostly concrete walls with a storage space under the stairs. I was convinced, mostly by myself, that it would be the coolest room and I would have so much space. My parents bought me new furniture, including a bunk bed, excuse me, a bunk bed, a CD player, a wardrobe, and even a desk to make it feel like an official big kid's room. Mm -hmm. As everyone knows, basements tend to be cold. So during the first few months, my parents would find me asleep upstairs in front of the gas fireplace with the heat turned all the way up. When asked why I kept coming upstairs, I would say that I had just gotten too cold, even though the basement was heated. Many times, I remember that even sitting by the heat, I would feel cold waves go through my body, and then I would create a blanket tent facing the heater with my arms (laughs) to ensure that the heat was getting trapped around me. Shortly after, they got me an electric blanket to try and keep me from getting up in the middle of the night, but little did I know at the time, the room temperature wasn't the issue. Over the next few years, I would wake up a couple of times a month to the stairs creaking, static coming from my CD player, the door handle jiggling as if someone were trying to get in my room, the mattress shifting mattress shifting sounds coming from the top bunk, the basement doors creep creaking open and closed and each time it would send me into a teary-eyed panic up the stairs screaming for my mom and dad like any good parent they were able to explain away the creeps as the house settling wind drafts and my favorite explanation of all time a child's overactive overactive (sighs) imagination and dreams many times to show me that everything was okay they would take me back downstairs and talk to me or rub my back until i fell asleep My friends who would come to spend the night would often leave about an hour into bedtime, claiming that they just wanted to go home because they missed their parents. This went on for years until I was about, I don't know, 10 or 11. On one particular night, it will stick with me for the rest of my life. I remember going down the stairs to bed and doing my regular checks around the room. Door shut tight, (laughs) CD player unplugged so I didn't forget to turn it off, move everything off the top bunk. You know, standard kid stuff. I remember lying in bed, not close to being sleepy, when my CD player started making a static sound. Knowing damn well I had unplugged it, I pulled the ultimate peeper move, pulling my ghost impenetrable blanket up to my chin and squeezing my eyes so tight so tears couldn't form. After what felt like an hour, which I'm sure was just minutes, the static stopped. Thinking it was all in my head, I started saying to myself, it wasn't real, it's all in my head, you're okay. That's when I felt my mattress shift in weight, as though someone or something was sitting near my knees at the edge of the bed, where my parents usually sat to lull me back to sleep. I opened my eyes to see an elderly woman sitting there, looking right at me with her finger pressed to her lips, a soothing shh sound resonating through my ears. Struck with fear, I tried to move but was frozen. Looking away and closing my eyes was the only thing I could manage. I returned my gaze to the spot only to see a dip in the blankets and mattress where she had been. I took off upstairs at a speed that you can only reach when terrified. (sighs) Finding my dad at the computer desk, I told him what happened. Smiling, he just said it was clearly a dream and that I could hang out with him where I fell asleep in the chair beside him. Somehow, I always felt comfortable in that area of the house. This prompted a year-long, almost nightly routine of sleepwalking up to the living room and sleeping on the couch. Frustrated and annoyed with always finding me on the couch or watching me crawl onto the couch, even if my parents were up watching a movie or had friends (laughs) over, my dad finally decided enough was enough. And one random day, he sat me down at our dining room table for a chat where what he told me would change my perspective on everything. He explained the woman I saw had actually died in our house of illness 
at an old age. Yee. Her husband, distraught with sadness, had shot himself in our living room shortly thereafter. Jesus. The cold feeling that I would get was just her spirit aimlessly going around the house, but the warmth in our kitchen was the woman trying to soothe me to sleep, and that was the elderly woman who was very nice and polite. Somehow, at about 11 years old, this made complete sense to me and put me at ease with all the creepy activities that had surrounded my life in that house. My dad told me that he gets the sensation when the woman or the man are around. I have had a lot of things happen in my life that made my dad think that I too would have a similar sixth sense as him. We eventually moved out of that house in my mid-teens. The person who bought that house saw my dad years later and asked, Hey, I know this is going to sound stupid, but did you ever experience anything weird at the house? My dad just laughed and asked, Was it the man or was it the woman? Flabbergasted, she said, (laughs) The man! Uh. I forgot something in the house, and when I went back in for it, there was a man standing in my living room with a shotgun. Jeez! When I screamed, he vanished. My dad explained that all she had to do was ask them nicely to leave her alone, and they should, as he never had had a problem with them. Ever since that day, I've been interested, but not as a dipshit Darren, about (laughs) ghosts, spirits, and other things that go bump in the night. My wife always asks me if our house is haunted, or if I have any feelings when we tour historic homes. Sometimes I pick up on stuff, and other times I'm as clueless as the next person. But I am always on the lookout for the next event or story that will help explain the unexplainable. Mm -hmm. Sincerely, Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. Good, huh? That was good. Yeah, I like that twist of the dad sitting down. It's like, where's this going? Uh Uh-huh. And then for the dad, like with an 11-year-old, just be like, oh, yeah, it's nothing. It's just it's ghosts. It's ghosts. We have two ghosts in the house. Totally normal. I've I've known about them for a while because, you know, one of them uh, killed themselves in the house. Yeah. And then the other one, you know, died later and looking around and God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And just like, I mean, it's kind of interesting to think about the idea of it being a hereditary thing that you can pick up on. Mm Mm-hmm. Things because we hear that a lot in stories like, well, you know, my grandmother had it and my mother yeah. had it and now I have it. Just this like. Yeah, it is interesting that it, that, it, that if it exists, could be also passed on like good eyesight. Yeah. Or, you know, great like hair. great hair. It's like, yep, got great hair from my dad. Nope, I got a sixth sense from my grandpa. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. To think about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like that story. Me too. I like both of them. Good job. Yeah. Shanks. Do you want to do some shouty outies? Yeah. Who, who or do, do you want me to go first? first? Woo. Okay. I- Oh, no, we both spoke at the same time. Oh. I was going to say, Jinx, pinch poke, <laughs> you owe me a Coke. Uh, I can go first. Okay. Okay. I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Don't forget to watch for your turn to buy tickets to camp, mm-hmm. patrons. Douglas Schuler, Kendra Novak, Dom, Alex, Alex's at Hogwarts, <laughs> Vanessa Finley, Michelle Hirschhart, Black Cat Familiar, Laura Kilmar, Amanda Honaker, Maria with the fat ass, <laughs> Eric Cruz, Arielle Morgan, Priscilla, Amanda Howell, Ashley Durham, Elizabeth, Del Heck, Sean Reynolds, April Barton, and Emily P. Seen. Nice. Nice. And I would like to thank the following Annabelles as well. Uh, John Trusty, Rachel, Jesse Jepson, Grace Ransom, Julie Piccolo, or Piccolo, uh, Sarah Henneberry, Amanda Matson, Chris Gatwood, uh, Winter, Sohn, Kinlock, S O N E. I know. I wasn't sure if that was Sohn or if that was actually Sony or Sony, Sony like a just a yeah. odd spelling. Sony Kinlock, uh, Jamie Lang, Cassandra Baylor, Mikey B, Michael Allwine, Don Reed, Alicia, uh, Triabchuk. It uh, looks like a Czechoslovakian name. I, know, I did, did not know how to say that. Triabzak, maybe. Uh, cheese? I like just cheese. 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 <laughs> uh, Nicole Dyke, Ky- Kayla May Basum, and Paul Belgram. All right. And I have the following spoopy shout outs to Stasha, or maybe Stasha, from Ryan. Happy 24th birthday again. Your big brother loves you very much. To Mariah, my Oklahoma heart bandit, from your fool of a husband, Nate. Happy belated birthday. I love you. To Chanel from Chanel. Hell yes to me for graduating from nursing school while working and being a mom and wife. Good on you, sister. And to B from someone who will always love you. Happy birthday. Thanks for keeping me going in my darkest moments and telling me like it is. Oh, 
And that is our show. Thanks again for the ratings and reviews. Always so appreciated. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith and Tyler C. for their work on social media, and Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to Logan for producing and directing today, Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, and to our book editor, Drew Atana, for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four. Thanks to producer Sophie Evans for finding the first story I told this week, and Olivia Lee for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch these shows. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want pictures to accompany the episodes at Scared to Death Podcast. Uh, you can follow us on TikTok as well, also at Scared to Death Podcast. And you can meet fellow Creeps and Peepers at the uh, private Facebook group we have called Creeps and Peepers. If you don't want to hear uh, any ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon. Get the entire catalog ad-free and so much more. If you want early access to camp tickets. <laughs> and don't forget yet, yeah, speaking of camp tickets, to mark your calendars, tickets go live January 16th, noon Pacific time, for the 2023 Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp. But only for the OG campers for last year initially. Those campers will be sent a link via email, and the link will be posted in the Wet Hot Facebook group. These campers will have 48 hours to make their purchases before tickets then also open up to all of our Bad Magic patrons, Wednesday, January 18th at noon Pacific time. Then after another 48 hours, Friday, January 20th, noon Pacific time, tickets are open up for everybody. And they will remain open for the OG campers and the patrons the whole time once they open up for them. We'll post a link on our socials and in future episode descriptions. Ticketing will then stay open for everyone until camp sells out. Woohoo! Limited tickets available. Uh, once the cabins are filled up, that is it. That's it. That is it. That's it. Uh, and especially for private cabin upgrades, very limited slots yeah, available very, for those. Very, very limited. So you have to be fast if you want one of those. This camp's going to be epic. We hope to work with Camp No Counselors for many years to come, making the experience bigger and better every time. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. See you at camp. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. Cheese. 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 Cheese.